This last presentation is a, a quick case study. I will zoom through the case study to leave lots of time for Q&A, um, but it also helps to apply all of these things in the real world uh, with a real world example. Um, and then obviously we, we're going to unpack all your questions at length. Uh, once again, we'll not focus on mathematics formulas or financial jargon. You can Google those and uh, go down those rabbit holes on your own. We happily reference them, but we're not going to unpack them. Uh, the agenda for this evening is a reminders of the, of the previous presentations to give us the tools to look at our case study. I've selected Metrofile Holdings, disclaimer up front, I personally hold that chair. Um, and we're going to, after looking at the remand of each of those, we're going to literally match them case by case for Metrofile um, to show how one applies this or should think about this before going to Q&A. So opening with the remand on fundamentals, what we're looking for is we want to find a business that is good quality. And what, what is good quality? That is a very broad phrase. So the starting point is to consider whether the business operates in an industry or sector with high barriers to entry that mean there are few competitors. Um, we want it within that sector to have strong competitive advantages by which it beats its competitors and preferably whatever good or service or goods and services it offers have no or few substitutes. The combination of these three things can lead to strong pricing power at a company level. And the final magical macro ingredient you're looking for is all of these things things are happening and this company is operating within a, a large total addressable market. A fish will never grow larger than the pool or the pond it swims in. So you want, you want a very small but fast growing fish in a very, very large and attractive pond. Um, now, those are all higher level things, understanding the business model uh, and understanding the industry and the macro factors. Once, but the best industry with the best fundamental drivers uh, can still have badly run businesses within that. So what we want to do is we want to zoom to the business itself and make sure that it is well run. Now, what, what is well run? Well, simplistically, we're looking for businesses with strong cash generation, appropriate cost structures, and appropriate debt or none. And then we are also being cognizant of other risks. Make sure that there are no or few major other risks. And if there are, are there mitigating factors? Because that, that will, the combination of understanding all these things will arm you with the toolkit to answer the question, is this a good business? After finding a business that you think is a good business, we've got to make sure that you do not overpay for its shares, its stock. We're looking at its valuation. So there's relative valuations and absolute valuations. Relative valuations, we've got to find a set of good comparative businesses, select logical metrics, and ensure that our company that we are looking at, its shares are attractively priced relative to those metrics. Or, and or actually, um, we can then go and forecast its expected future ca free cash flows, its expected dividends, and present value those to arrive at an absolute valuation. All of this is to ensure that whatever we are paying for the stock, for the shares in this company, we are not overpaying, preferably deeply underpaying. The final thing, once we found a company that we like, and we're making sure we're not overpaying for it, we repeat this process a thousand, thousand times. Um, and from these, we build up a collection of stocks that we like and we put them together. Now, that's called a portfolio. And our objective in a portfolio is to hold the collection of good stocks that are as different as possible. Remember, you make investments, but you manage portfolios at a portfolio level. It's all about managing risk. It's the risk. Risk is the chance that future outcomes differ from your expectations. And we use diversification as the best tool to manage that risk. But consider things like optimal diversification and still appreciate that no matter how diversified you're looking to be, each individual investment in your portfolio should still stand on its own merits. Its own merits being fundamentals and valuation. Um, that is a reminder of, of the three steps to in investing. 
Um, now we're going to jump into the case study. Like I said, I'm going to zoom through this. I could, I could spend hours talking about uh, the companies I've researched, but um, I won't. I'm going to zoom through this quickly. Metrofile Holdings, share code is MFL, is listed on the JSE. It's an African document storage group. And in fact, it is the dominant one if you have a look at uh, the market shares. Its business model is really end-to-end -end document management. Now, what that means, and, uh, and to the right here, I've tried to uh, represent this with a, with a pretty graphic, but we have documents and filings and boxes and stationery and especially forms and FICA documents and court documents and banking documents and all these things are generated and they're generated by economic activity. The more uh, economic activity, the more transactions, the more documents are generated. And some of these documents need to be stored. Think of your FICA documents. The FASE Act did, um, dictates, or the FICA Act dictates that these documents are stored for client life of a relationship and plus five years since the termination from the date of a uh, final transaction. Now, who stores these and how does that happen? Well, this is Metrofile. Clients can store these documents themselves, but when they are particularly sensitive and they have to be stored for particularly long periods of time and they're particularly voluminous, it maybe isn't a client's core business to have warehouses full of documents. So it's typically at a high end outsourced and Metrofile picks up these documents and these documents flow in and arrive in their document storage where they charge, be it monthly, quarterly, binary or annually clients, um, effectively storage income for safely storing these documents, picking them up, storing them, retrieving them and bring them back to the client where necessary. And all, so as these documents grow over time and as Metrofile fills their, uh, their racking and their warehouses with all the special infrastructure around it to make sure the documents are safe and secure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, fireproof and so on. Um, they are effectively earning annuity income on the storage. It's almost like a very specialized property company. But instead of uh, having tenants that are lessees, they have documents on shelves. Now, off the base of this, they offer... Um, business support services, uh, and they offer digital services, uh, which are complementary to what they do, especially digital services and this digital strategy, which I can touch on briefly. But this is the flow of activity that drives the revenue in the core and the heart of Metrofile, uh, Metrofile Records Management. And then the final, the final point is at some point, those documents have been stored for enough um, maybe five years has elapsed and those FICA documents can be destroyed and Metrofile will even offer on the way out the final secure destruction of those documents and earn, a, earn effectively an exit fee in the document leaving. And this is the, this is the business model that is Metrofile. Um, as a background, they, they were formed in 1983. They've got operations predominantly in South Africa, but into the Middle East and Africa. They've got, um, they've got a, a large number of facilities but a couple of years ago, they made a good acquisition in Kenya, but it was poorly debt funded. This triggered a change in management that saw them relook at their portfolio of businesses, streamline it, and begin a process of de-gearing while they developed a digital strategy. I'll touch on these developments later. Major shareholders of the MRC, the Sabvest, they've got a 1.5 million billion market cap, uh, 10 times multiple, and 3% dividend yield. So that's Metrofile. I go back to, remember, we, we are working through a list here. I'm trying to tie the theory into a practical example, fundamentals, then valuation, and how it fits into a portfolio. So understanding the context is important, but how does Metrofile stack up? Well, it's looking at barriers to entry. Um, Metrofile actually has, the document management industry actually has very high barriers to entry typically because of two key reasons. The first one is reputational. Um, you are typically storing very sensitive documents for clients. They won't give, the big banks won't give their sensitive banking documents and your FICA documents to just anyone to store. So you've got long established relationships 
Uh, you've got a lot of trust and loyalty on the table and Metrofile does a lot to protect that. So there's strong reputational barriers to entry. And then even if you're a very trustworthy individual and turn around and say, hey guys, I'll store your documents and everyone trusts you. Do you have the scale to do that? Do you have the operational scale? Do you have warehouses scattered all around the country and into Africa and Middle East such that you can economically store these documents wherever you are and sign national time, uh, clients? So um, there are actually reasonably high barriers to entry here. Within the space, the competitive advantages that Metrofile has playing against its, its competitors, of which domestically Iron Mountain is the largest, is it in fact has the longest of the longstanding relationships. More subtly, it is empowered. MRC is the Mine Workers Investment Corporation. I think I've got that right, but they're the empowerment part that which makes Metrofal empowered. And so, more subtly, they've got the sunk cost of built facilities and storage. So the, the incremental marginal cost of further documents are, are much less than, uh, than, than some guys who are running at full capacity. And in fact, Metrofile owns many of its properties, which means it doesn't need to hack its storage revenue faster than inflation, because when you own the property, inflation is actually your advantage, um, because your costs are not just fixed, um, you, you're the owner, owner of, of the fixed cost. Um, so it's got good competitive advantages as well. Then we have a look at substitute goods or services. Well, clients can store their own documents. Now, this comes with pros and cons, and it depends on the client, depends on the industry, and depends on the volumes and the complexity. But more obviously, as the world becomes digital, some transactions shift from paper to digital, and there may not be documents to store. So client self-storage and digital services are partial substitutes for some clients. Partial, not complete. There are literal legal reasons why a physical document still needs to exist and be stored in some cases, um, which I will get to at, at some point, but it leads to resilient pricing power. So if we look at the pricing power Metrofile, instead of arguing it, it's best to go and look at it. Here is the, the gross profit margin and the operating margin of Metrofile over time. First of all, you can see the gross profit margin is well above 50%. Uh, and the, uh, the operating margin is, is a do comfortable double digits as well. So I think I'm com uh, comfortable in saying that they've got, they've got and maintained strong margins, which is a good example of pricing power. And it is, lends us evidence that they have that within a large total addressable market, which is number five here. Well, what is driving the need to store documents besides even economic activity, et cetera, et cetera, what is actually driving it is compliance and regulatory requirements. And these are ballooning. There are more and more compliance regulatory requirements demanding more and more things are, 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 are checked, captured, and stored. And they're absolutely ballooning, especially in financial services, but that creep of compliance regulation is going into other sectors as well. So there are strong tailwinds that are driving uh, this, this market and arguably making it much, much larger. Um, so comfortable with the macro, if we zoom into the, how the business is actually run, is Metrofile, it's in a comfortable sector, but is it run well? Then we need then we look at cash generation, the cost structure, and the debt. And I will jump over the page here. The cash generation of Metrofile, ignoring this wobble here and this wobble here, is, is most, of the, most of the earnings are converting comfortably into cash. And in fact, in recent years, the trend has gone up. Um, same with returns on assets. So if we have a look at the cost structure, a good way of to consider that is to look at the margins, which figure one shows, and to look at how those margins are translating as return on assets. Um, and besides, once again, the wobble here, which I've touched on, 
that um, there was a change in management that have driven the turnaround back to back to historical pro- mean and back to historical profitability. Uh, the return on assets is 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 really really high, comfortably above ten percent, approaching fifteen and sometimes even twenty percent. And then how does the debt look? Well, once again, debt has historically been reasonably low. This is when the big acquisition came on board. The debt that overgeared themselves, it was badly structured. Management change is seeing, uh, driving this debt down or driving the cash conversion up and the profitability and margins being maintained. And we are seeing a business that is looking more and more comfortably geared with historical, um, historical profitability, cash conversion margins, returns all intact. Um, And that's why these things cannot be viewed in isolation. They need to be viewed in context. And you need to know this background to know what numbers to look at. And are they improving or are they they, uh, getting worse? Because businesses are not static. So I'm comfortable in saying in terms of fundamentals, Metrofile is a good business. They went through a wobble, management have changed, and they're driving a very commendable improvement uh, in the business. And in fact, in terms of major risks are touched on the digital services, they have identified this as a risk and they are moving and they've in fact made an acquisition in the digital space. They are driving a very clear digital strategy, which could see them uh, offset, offset this, uh, this background risk while maintaining their core that, that looks comfortable. All of this comes through in return on equity. And you could see across time that the company's averaged at about a 20% return on equity, which is wonderful. Besides the wobble, their equity has swung back in play and we're, we're in a very healthy trajectory at this point. So I'm comfortable in saying Metrofile, is it a good business? I believe it is a good business. Um, but how much are we paying for it? So first of all, I need to look for a set of comparatives select logical metrics from it and ensure that it's attractively priced. Iron Mountain is the largest document storage business in the world. It is listed in America. um, And I'm going to use that as my comparative. But we need to be cognizant of valuations in the digital storage space because of the strategy that the group is driving. If they get it right, we may get an, we may need to look into the digital storage space to see what the future of Metrofile could look like. Um, so before I jump to the absolute valuations, I'm going to show you the relatives. So is Metrofile a good relative for Iron Mountain? Well, they're both document storage businesses. Um, take my word for it. When you dig into the business models, there is a good good similarity from it. Um, Iron Mountain might be a little further down in terms of the digital uh, digital strategy that they have, but Metrofile has had a very good start. In terms of metrics, financial metrics, you can see that Iron Mountain is as profitable as Metrofile, um, particularly at an EBITDA level um, uh, across time, so the average, so not 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 the one-off. Because that can that can vary year to year. When you're looking at rolling averages, it's, it's always a more comfortable metric. And and Iron Mountain Metrofile are almost spot on in terms of profitability at an EBITDA level. But when you look at returns on capital employed, returns on assets, and in fact that return on effort, assets average over time, Metrofile is miles more profitable than Iron Mountain, which means for each rand I've put into Metrofile, it should generate a higher return than than Iron Mountain. But all of that said, comfortable in terms of profitability. So it comes through as a reasonable comparative. Um, The gearing ratios, though, do show that Metrofile has much less debt than Iron Mountain. So not just is it more profitable, uh, it actually has less debt. But this is, these are the kind of things to consider, including, including Iron Mountain's uh, business model. And I'm comfortable, and you can take my word for it and go and check up on this uh, on your own time. Iron Mountain is a reasonable comparative for, for Metrofile Holdings. In which case, how much and what multiple does Iron Mountain trade at? You can see here, and by the way, the one thing counting against Metrofile is that Iron Mountain is dramatically larger. So Metrofile has, a, has an implied discount because it's smaller. 
and you'll see that coming out in later, uh, later valuation slides. But when you look at Iron Mountains trading on a 13 times EBITDA versus I Metrofiles 5, Iron Mountains 5% uh, free cash flow yield versus Metrofiles 10. Price earnings of 21 versus Metrofiles 10. Price to sales, et cetera, et cetera. Dividend yield is the only one that's different. Dividend yield is the only one that Metrofile is trading at a small discount, uh, so, sorry, a small premium to Iron Mountain. All the others are at discounts. And that's because uh, Metrofile is paying out a lower proportion of its profits, focusing on de-gearing and focusing on their digital migration strategy. And especially since it has higher returns of capital employed, that should come out in higher, higher future growth rates. So I'm not too worried about the dividend yield. But on every other basis, you can see Metrofile is discounted against Iron Mountain. But we have a look at the digital peers, Equinix Digital Reality Trust and Dropbox. Um, Metrofile is not just discounted against Iron Mountain's valuation in the market, it is massively discounted against the digital peers that are trading at just insane multiples. And in fact, when you look at their returns, on some cases are making losses. But they're purely digital, so they're not exposed against uh, the digitization of the world. They actually benefit from it. So if Metrofile gets their digital strategy right, it just shows the potential uplift one can get. Anyhow, looking at the valuation, I'm comfortable that Metrofile is cheap uh, from a relative basis. Next, I look at the absolute basis. I've decided not to do a, dis uh, not to do a dividend discount model. I'm focusing on, the app, on, the, on a, a discounted free cash flow model. And in fact, what I've done is I've built a discount to free cash flow per segment. I'm not going to show all of them. I'm just showing the major segment, which is the uh, Metrofile Records Management of Southern Africa. Our forecast net box growth. Um, remember, they earn revenue off the boxes. As they drive box growth, they drive revenue. I build in a little bit of inflation into the pricing per box. And then I build assumptions around digital revenue growth. Um, their fixed cost is largely based and it bleeds out through EBITDA margins. And that ultimately that comes through uh, as EBITDA. I then have working capital assumptions. Their CapEx is relatively light. There's very, very little expansionary CapEx. It's mostly maintenance CapEx. Um, and and uh, what we have is we have the standard tax assumptions that arrive at a, at a free cash flow, uh, discount that, and I arrive at my, my estimated uh, enterprise value for this segment, which is on an eight times EV EBITDA, which remember Iron Mountain trades in a 13 times. So I'm comfortable that this is not a ludicrous valuation. It's, quite, it's within the ballpark. Now I go and do exactly the same thing for each one of the segments across Metrofile, including the group overheads, which are present value and I take out because it's a cost. Now, um, it has a negative uh, enterprise value. I arrive then at an enterprise value, which is pre-debt. I take out the debt. I arrive at my fair value. How much is attributable to me as a shareholder? That fair value I divide by the number of shares and I arrive at a fair value of 405 cents. Now, this is slightly out of date. They've made a digital acquisition. Time has moved on, et cetera, et cetera. But I checked that valuation uh, and it's on a 12.7 times multiple versus Iron Mountain's 21.5. So it's still comfortably valued versus the comparatives within the ballpark. It is quite comfortable. Now, is 405 cents per share cheap or expensive? Well, the fact that they're trading at 350 cents means I am comfortable about this valuation. So in conclusion, on fundamental basis, Metrofile appears to be a good company. Iron Mountain is a good comparative for that company. And on an absolute and a relative valuation basis, it appears comfortably priced. Therefore, it's a good company and apparently its share appears cheap. Now, do you include this in your portfolio or not? Which first of all, is not a financial recommendation and I'm not gonna give you the answer. The portfolio consideration depends on what your portfolio looks like, what, what you're interested in, how it fits in. So these are the things I would consider when adding Metrofile to a portfolio or not adding it. First of all, it is a South African listed company that has predominantly South African and some African and Middle Eastern exposure. Do you want that geographic exposure? It is a small cap. 
It is not a large cap. Do you want small cap exposure? It is in the document industry that has compliance regulatory tailwinds, but it has digital migration uh, headwinds. Do you want that combination of things? And perhaps do you believe in the digital strategy that moves moves the uh, the odds in your favor in terms of the headwinds? Do you want those exposures? Do you believe in it? Do you believe that paper will just disappear one day or will remain relevant? Um, they also have a slightly lower grow, grow, uh, growth profile and a slightly higher yield profile. Are those things that are important for you? They were also subject to two potential suitors to potentially uh, take them over and delist the business. Would you like that takeover optionality in your, in your portfolio? I can't answer that for you. You need to answer that. That is how I would think about Metrofile, how I would unpack it against its fundamentals, its valuation, and then arrive at a conclusion and consider whether to include it in your portfolio. So without further ado, let's swing to questions. Unmute myself. A couple of questions coming in. Uh, folks, I also dropped a link to uh, Blue Gym Research, Keith's Research Cup Business, which has got a, a detailed look at Metrofile at, at the same time. Uh, if you've got more questions, bring them in. Keith, the, the first question coming through is that the, the process which we've gone through is going to be much more applicable to sort of mature stocks, i.e. A, a new tech startup or an exploration miner. You've got to come at it from a completely different perspective um, and truthfully, probably a much higher risk perspective as well. So I, I disagree. Hmm. You're, let, let, me, let me unpack why I disagree. You're still analyzing a business. Now, it might just be if it's really early stage, it's a business in an Excel spreadsheet and it's an idea, but it's still, it's still potentially a business. So your starting point, I go back to these fundamentals. Um, you will still say, okay, ignoring the business, what industry is it playing in? What are the barriers to entry? What are its competitive advantages? Let me use fintech in the banking space as an mm -hmm. example. Okay, you can go and analyze a fintech stock in the banking space. What are the barriers to entry? Well, banking license. You're yeah, okay, but this thing isn't the bank. It somehow gets around that. You go, okay, that's great. So it can operate in a high barrier to entry industry with few competitors and assuming it legally can somehow either get around it or have it, but it, but it can start to attack that. So then what are its competitive advantages? How is it going to beat the existing players? Um, and then maybe, it's, maybe it does something automatedly and low cost and much cheaper than the banks can do it. Um, yeah, okay, that's brilliant. Well, then in which case you, you are the substitute good or service in that space. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, you go, okay, well, that actually plays in your advantage. So your substitute goods or services that people don't want to change. They want to go with the established players. Then unpack uh, how big you need to get, how big is the market? Will you start to have pricing power? Or are you going to be a commodity? And then ultimately, all of this combines, you say, do you like the business case and how they're going to go about it? And especially if there's a little bit of track record, how are they going to fund it? debt versus equity, what, what are the costs? What's it, is it fixed cost heavy? Is it variable costing? And then what is its working capital cycle likely to be? Now, all of these things, you probably won't be able to do in a relative valuation, but you will sit down and run a DCF so that you're forecasting what your outcomes are and ultimately arrive at a valuation and you know what your entry price is and therefore you make a decision. So, I circle all around, and yes, yeah. I think you can do this for early okay. stage businesses. Yeah, no, I, I like your point. No, uh, question coming from anonymous uh, asking Adapter T, what happens if your choice was to retain the shares now that they're off the JSC? I mean, the short answer is that you still own the business. You will get dividends. You will get invited to AGMs. Uh, what you don't have is liquidity. In other words, how do you sell those shares? Some companies will set up uh, platforms for buyers and sellers. Uh, I don't know if they will in this case. And then at some point they might make an offer to the to the small shareholders because they, they're often an expense to the business. But that's why I don't hold unlisted is because exiting is, is nigh on impossible. The valuation of unlisted businesses typically and academically should be lower than listed. So the moment it goes unlisted, whatever it was valued at, it should now be at a discount to that because there's no liquidity. Add to that, 
that you are a minority and unlisted business and a lot of very bad things can happen to you if, they, if the majority abuses their position, which one hopes they doesn't. I'm not saying in a Daftati's case they will, but mm-hmm. I'm just saying be cognizant of this. Um, there is a concept called minority leakage. And if you're an unscrupulous majority uh, shareholder, you, t- you squeeze the taps uh, tight and you, you make sure very little goes out to the minority and you capture all the benefit yourself. Yeah, well, I, I, with Adaptati, I think it's a very, very small number. But I, I, as I say, I just stay away. Solly's got a great question. What mm. about companies such as Arc, African Rainbow Capital, um, where some of the companies are, are listed, so we can value them nicely, but some are not listed. So we just simply don't have the level of information and we have to rely on, de- on, on uh, directors. I know, Keith, you had a look at Rain versus, who did you compare it to? Was it MTN or one of the other telcos? to try because uh, we just don't mm. get the data. Yeah, so, and, and that's a great question. So first of all, the first thing, the first thing I do when I look at these investment holding companies is I go and look at their cost structure and then I build an NPV or a discounted free cash flow model for their costs. So I can present value it and I know what discount to take out of their net asset value then. That's the way I approach that. Then the question is, well, what do we value the rest at? Well, listed companies are simple. Value them at listed price. Let, mm-hmm. let the market do the heavy lifting for you there and value it. Um, in some instances, you maybe want to take out a little bit of a discount for liquidity. They might not be able to sell a large amount of a illiquid share at market. They might have to take a discount on it. And there might be capital gains you want to take out as well. Then on the unlisted side, this gets trickier. This gets, you've got to go and dig, dig around and find management have to disclose how they valued the unlisted. Now, if they don't disclose that, that's the first warning sign. That's a massive red flag, huge amount of distrust then in whatever that un- unlisted valuation is. Once they do disclose it, they might disclose a, a DCF. Uh, with discount rates and go and look at, uh, consider whether those valuations and those assumptions are reasonable if you agree with them. If you don't agree with them, higher or lower, adjust that valuation accordingly. And, or they might disclose it on a, on a relative basis. So we valued it with a price earnings of 15 times. Is 15 high or low? Go and find a, re- a listed peer and go and check if this is what businesses like this go for. Mm. Um, and, and consider those things to arrive at to arrive at a soft view, whether the whether the unlisted assets are probably overvalued or undervalued or fairly valued. Very rarely are they undervalued. At best, they'll be fairly valued. Um, and in, in in a lot of instances with unscrupulous investment companies especially when they charge their fees or charge as a percentage of assets, <laughs> yeah. they have an incentive to inflate the valuation of those assets so that they literally earn more money as a management team and as an external manco. Then, then, then you know what? Be brutal and take out a discount from, from that before arriving at your, your own view of what their net assets are. Yeah, and, and, and the point you slipped in there, remember capital gains. Now, you know, uh, ARC is probably not going to sell rain, but if ever they do, they've made a profit. There's a tax component and capital gain for companies is more than individuals. The other point, and I remember Breit, when they uh, were going back uh, maybe five years or even more, and they would value their businesses on a EBITDA, uh, a, a price EBITDA. Um, and then they would say, and we do it at a lower level than, than what the you know, the comparable businesses are trading it. And, and that was all true. But they started to change the metrics that they used. So I can't remember, but they they valued it at eight times uh, uh, EBITDA. And then they tweaked that to 10. And it was like, hmm, yeah, why, why that shift? Why that change? Um, yeah, so that's, that's definitely something I look at as well. Look at m- multiple creep. Mm-hmm. Um, if companies are valuing things like that, is one year it's eight, the next year it's nine, then it's 10 times price earnings, then 12, then 15. And, and they're very happy to tell you that their net asset has grown, but actually what's happened is earnings have been flat in these businesses that have just increased the multiple, the value of them at. Big yeah. warning signs that. Yeah, yeah. And I also like to look for directors who actually sometimes take it down and they say it was a you know, 
this business isn't what we thought it was. Uh, Gerhard is, asks a great question. How do you start with those if, in, initial stocks? So, I mean, you know, the, the, it's a process where you, you filter through, but, you know, in the JSC, there's well, investably probably two, maybe 250 shares. Globally, there are literally thousands. Do you start with sort of like a, 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 a filter, which, which will, you know, take your, let's take the JSC from 200 down to 100, and then a second filter, which takes your 100 down to, uh, 20 or 30 or something um to 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 so you don't have to go and do every stock on the market so the long answer is if you want to be a professional go and do every stock um there's there there are no shortcuts to primary research but this is this is to a retail audience and that's a great question this still has to be practical and you want to maintain mm -hmm. your day job and you don't have time to do all of that a filter is fantastic uh, on a global basis there are too many stocks for even professionals to look at. So on a global basis, I will use filters. And they can be fancy filters and very specific things I'm looking for and unpacking and I can zoom into sectors and filter within. But absolutely. So if, if for example, if valuation is particularly important, and by the way, um, I, one of the presentations in the series talks about the different styles of investing. And it shows... Whichever one makes sense to you will emphasize something different. A value investor will emphasize value, the valuation of the stock over other, other attributes. A growth investor will, will emphasize the growth of the uh, business over, over the different attributes. Whatever, or a yield investor can look for like dividend yields, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever it is that is important to you, go and filter that down arrive at that short list and then, then dig into them. I think that's an absolutely valid way of doing it. And by the way, maybe it's not financial metrics you're looking at. Maybe you go, you know what? I think inflation is going to run rampant. I want to be hedged against inflation. What are the best hedges? Well, companies with pricing power um, in the retail sector or this or that or that. Or maybe I think the world's going to collapse and I want exposure to gold so let me go and find the best gold miner um so you can also filter by but you can your filters can start off thematically look for themes and then filter into those further so however you start at it arriving at a short list but then digging in in detail is a good way and a practical way to do it yeah and and at the filtering side some of the the brokers uh my broker does let me do some some rudimentary, but it, 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 it works fairly well. What, what I would also say is, is I mean, maybe there's a service or something that you really think is excellent. Go, you know, and it's like, hey, it's a listed company. Mm. Um, if you watch Business Day TV or, or, or listen to uh, Keith, Mark, and myself doing uh, predictions earlier today on JSC Direct, you know, never hear someone say, this is a great stock and you go and rush off. But you 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 start to sort of learn people's thinkings and the stuff. And maybe Graham Kerner on, on Stockwatch or, or, or whoever, you can also use that as a start point because you know they're not going to they, they they obviously like the stocks that they they're punting they might not always be you know what you consider to be value but they're unlikely to go and and suggest a a dog of a stock so yeah, there's that's, ways that's, to cheat like that as well yeah that that's a great suggestion another way to do it is pull up the pull up find people you like and find their portfolios if they're fund managers it'll yeah. be their fund and go what did they hold and go, and go and dig through that and see if you can figure out why they're holding it. So idea generation, we, we're in a world full of ideas and, and there's a million ways to generate this, but a great suggestion, Simon. I actually like that fund idea. So, you know, I mean, don't go and take the coronation top 20 because that, but, you know, go, go find, I was going to say the SIM small cap, but that's what, 60 stocks. So that's a truckload. But you can even just use that as a, a you know, so the, the small cap fund has got 50 or 60 stocks in it. That's already taken your 250 down to 50. And you can then start with that. Oh, I, I would be more subtle uh, than that. So the small cap fund means you're only going to get small caps in it. What if, what if the best stock is a large cap? So what you really want to do, yeah. unless you've decided what you want is a small cap, in which case that's a great start. Uh, and you've already filtered it somewhat. But, but also consider looking at general equity funds where guys have literal, literally the entire playing field and they can hold anything. Why is that the stock that they hold the most of? um yeah no, be it small or large cap yeah a follow-up from solly which is a little more specific but but we can take it generally and he's talking he says that last year 2021 a lot of really chunky dividends special dividends especially in mining 
uh, especially in PGM, gold miners as well, actually. Uh, well, actually, all of them, Kumba, mining was just paying dividend. Um, should we expect the same this year, or do we get significant decreases? Uh, I'm going to give two short answers, and I'll pass over to Keith. Uh, Sorry, something, for example, Kumba Iron Ore is the easiest company in the world to value. Um, go see what the, the, the price was that they re received for Iron Ore in the last reporting period. I think it was $160 a tonne work out their margin, uh, find the iron ore price, see what the average is going to be for this period. And you can back work that out and see what their cash flow is going to be and how much will come through. I'm also not convinced we're going to necessarily, particularly in the PGM space, see massive decreases in dividends because the, the, the first six months of last year was the, was the best six months for PGM miners in the history of PGM mining. But the second six months was the second best six months and the one, the, the six month period we're in currently to June is probably going to match that H2. So there might be some decrease, but I don't, I don't expect them to, to crater. So what I will add to that is when considering investing in, in mining stocks or mines, consider for a moment that, I mean, it's quite a unique asset is mines have zero pricing power. Yeah. They don't get to dictate what they sell their, sell their, you know, iron ore, their coal, or their gold, or their platinum at. The market dictates what, what, what their price is. So what is a mine? Well, first of all, it's a finite resource. And this is their barrier, their barriers to entry and competitive advantages, ignoring, ignoring mining licenses and well, ignoring regulatory and community yeah. stuff and stuff. But their barrier to entry and their competitive advantage is all, all the same thing. It's our own this resource underground. Um, if the resource is good, there's no substitutes for it, but they don't get the pricing power and the target market is the world because they can export it, sell it here, whatever, whatever it is. So what are you doing when you're buying a mine? Well, you're buying a finite life resource that is a cost structure, but cannot determine its price. And that cost structure is predominantly fixed. So it, the resource is either deep or shallow, it is either expensive to mine or it is cheap to mine. It is either near to a port or far from a port or it's got rayage or it doesn't. So it's either cheap to export, expensive to export. It, a mine is a finite life resource with a cost structure. Your ultimate call when you're comfortable that the resource is good and the cost structure is as low as possible, your ultimate call is what is the price going to do? And the mind doesn't dictate that. You've got to understand the commodity. Yeah. And, and truthfully, is it fair to say that a, a, outside of exploration and all of those sort of stuff, which miners do, uh, ultimately, you, you make that call on the commodity. It's an easy thing. So making the call on the commodity is hard. But the rest is, I think, mining is one of the easier sectors to, to, to get a handle of certainly cash flows. Now, the market would do what it will to the price. But it, 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 I typically find them uh, somewhat easier to, to, to work out because of that largely fixed cost, largely fixed output, a couple of percentage points either way. Um, and then basically, it's a bet in the commodity. Absolutely. I mean, if you get the commodity right and ignoring eccentricities and smaller companies and this and that, so this is a huge rule of thumb uh, and probably use it predominantly more with large caps than with small caps in the mining space. But if you get the commodity right, you're you're 80 90 percent of the way there with yeah. the company yeah yeah um a, a great question coming through what happens when i'm comparing a couple of stocks within a sector um so say it's banking or whatever it might be and and i, I come out with with maybe two or even three stocks that are you know to my mind identical in terms of valuations in terms of qualities etc i've got some pros and cons but broadly the same what about taking two banks and putting them in your portfolio rather than just picking the one? And I know for my case, I like to pick the clear winner. I will buy two in a sector. I hate to buy three in a sector because when I'm buying three in a sector, I think I'm missing something. Your take, Keith? Yeah, that, that's actually an excellent question. And if you remember, when we go to portfolios, um, you make investments, but you manage portfolios. So I can't answer that question for you, but I can unpack different styles of investing. You can only answer that question depending on your risk profile and your preferred style of investing. So I tend to be in Simon's camp where I want to make one call 
And by, if I arrive at a sector with two companies, um, I will, I will, yeah, you know, I will pull every detail out possible, including director remuneration and bonus structures and things like that, literally to find which one is better than the other one and make my call based on that. Um, but that arrives at more concentrated portfolios, which me and Simon are obviously comfortable to have. If you've done all your homework and, you, and you're more risk averse and want a more diversified portfolio, it's absolutely valid to go and add those two stocks to your portfolio in the same sector. Then you just need to be cognizant of diversification, not at stock level, but at sector level. So say you want to hold... Yeah. Uh, say you want to hold 20 stocks and all of them at 5%. If you add two banks to your portfolio, you've actually added 10% exposure to the banking sector, not 5%. So maybe add those two stocks, but add them at 2.5% weighting each so that your sector exposure is still not over what, whatever you want it to be. So there's the beauty about investing is there is no there's no real wrong answer so long as you've thought it through and you've arrived at a logical conclusion that suits you. Um, and that's the important thing. Don't just do it, think it through and understand what you're doing, um, including the risks. Um, it really is a personal de de decision how you go about that. I, I think that's one of the key points in this whole series, Keith, is that there's there's no right or wrong answer. Ultimately, the market will vote you by price, but but you know that's beyond our control. Um, but but what I think is important is make conscious decisions. Know why you're yes. having. For, for example, I used to hold two banks. We're going way back a decade or more. I had Standard Bank and Capitec, and there was a solid reason. I liked Standard Bank's EM exposure. Okay, didn't work. Hence, I don't own it. But I, I liked Standard Bank for a dominant position locally, which was being eaten by Capitec but then EM, rest of Africa and the like. And I really, really liked that. And Capitec gave me, it was a bank, but it was a fundamentally different proposition in, in, in terms of it. Um, and and, and it, it's not that it's right or wrong, it's just be be aware. And the trick I do is when I, when I, when I buy a stock, I, I write down the top three things I like about it. Uh, and I also write down the top three things I dislike about it so that I'm consciously thinking recording both sides and then I can then go back to it because you know I, I, I remember why I bought Standard Bank but some of the shares in my portfolio otherwise I'm, I'm, I'm yeah the valuation was good but what was the, the you know the, the compelling reason why it was that one and not another one perhaps as the case may be it's that conscious decision and that's what we're doing in investing rather than just sort of running in you know eyes closed hoping for the best yeah if, if I can add to that then someone's right make it's fun to take a risk. In fact, yeah, investing is taking risks. Mm -hmm. But make sure two things exist. One, it's a conscious risk. It's not an accidental risk. It's a conscious risk. And two, you're being paid to take that risk. Um, what I mean by that is that you think the odds are on your side. That, that this risk will play out in your favor. So you're not taking a conscious risk, but you go, you know what, this will probably not work. That, that's a yeah. terrible risk to take. Don't take that <laughs> risk then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I view every trade as, as, as you know, jumping out of an airplane. I mean, it, it's, yeah, make it work. Uh, Raymond, uh, yeah, the, the recording will be up on just one lap. Can I say lunchtime tomorrow? Because it's been my first week back and I'm, I'm tired and I've got some missions in the morning. It will be on just one lap. Uh, tomorrow tomorrow lunchtime, you will find it there. Ladies and gents, we will park that there. I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. I am seeing another one. Uh, Gareth quickly snuck in. How do you allocate weighting uh, for the various stocks or bonds in your portfolio? If you hold 10 stocks, is it as simple as roughly 10% for each? Mm. So uh, first of all, how many stocks uh, to hold is also a decision around risk. Um, the, the more stocks, and this is academically speaking, the more stocks you hold, the more diversified your portfolio is, the less stocks you hold, the more concentrated your portfolio is. But if you get it right, the more upside you can potentially make that is independent of the market. Um, so it's asymmetrical risk, uh, in, uh, you know, it's, it, uh, it's versus symmetrical risk that is the market, if the market is symmetry. Uh, I'm getting way too academic. So um, first of all, how many stocks you hold 
is up to you. Uh, that's a risk profile decision. But my starting point, and I aim to hold uh, 20 to 30 stocks. That's, that's my target. That's it. Um, onshore, offshore, everywhere combined, I actually take my two portfolios and I stick them together to make sure that none of my weightings are out irrespective of exchange rates. And with 20 stocks of portfolio, when I'm looking to add a new, new company to the portfolio, my default position is 5%. If, I, if I, maybe it's lowly liquid or it's a little bit risky or something, maybe I'll add a bit less than 5%. Maybe it's such a screamingly good investment or for some other reason i might add a bit more than five percent but i won't drift too far out of those bands um you know i won't go and i won't go and put 20 percent of the portfolio and in, into a stock or and and why bother putting one yeah. percent if, if your target is 20 percent but my starting, my default position is equal weighting. And from there, depending on the risk, the conviction, the liquidity, the various things, I will, I will change the weighting from that. Um, that's, there's no right or wrong way to do it. That's the way I do it. Maybe your starting point is what the benchmark holds. And then you're, that's your weighting and you're over and under weight from there. Yeah, so I, I, just, I hold a little less stocks. I hold about 12 to 15 but uh, 56, 7% of my portfolio is ETF. So that obviously gives me massive diversification. And I think Keith, you chatted about this in the video on, on portfolio uh, construction. And I also hold slightly less for two reasons. One, because I back myself to find the best 12 or 15. And I always can think that the next five or 10 are going to be sort of the, the long tail laggers. That's not true, but that's what I like to believe. Um, and also because uh, uh, analyzing stocks is not my full-time job. So I, I, I've got less time in my work week uh, to, 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 to put into it. And that, that was a decision I took you know, way, way back when I actually had other jobs outside of the, 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 the market. But it, it is a case of you know, also what's comfortable. I like your idea, Keith, as well as the, the, the benchmark weighting. But careful of going, yeah, I've seen portfolios with... 30 stocks and, and a couple of them are half a percent to 1%. And, you know, either, either put it in or, or don't, don't go halfway. Well, uh, I like the mental exercise of uh, having a concentrated portfolio makes you really think about what you add mm -hmm. and what you don't add. Um, so, so you've got to be convicted to hold a large investment in something. Um, and therefore, it, it's almost like putting a firecracker under yourself or a gun to your head and, and making you, this is the incentive to do the work and, and, and make the decision. Uh, and hopefully you're right and you get the benefit thereof. And it's a spectacular benefit when it comes to in a concentrated portfolio. But what I find is that the bloated portfolios where they've got a thousand stocks and, and the final stock is a 0.001% mm. weighting. Um, guys don't do work on small positions uh it's just human behavioral i, I just uh, in my experience i yeah. find people get lazy with the tail ends of portfolios and they just add it they just stick it in whatever it's a this it's a that so it's also a good mental exercise but it all once again that doesn't necessarily mean it's for you you need to make that decision on your your end that's yeah, just and, what I found. And 15 stocks is 30 sets of results a year, and they tend to cluster around uh, sort of the August and February period. Um, yeah. And again, you know, I, I read a lot of results, but the ones I really go into are those that I hold. And yeah. again, you know, it's not just that selection process. A, a last point as well is because of the, the you know, I, I don't take 6 or 8% and drop it into a stock on day one because the RAND value still scares me. I've been doing this forever, but it still spooks me. So what I do is I'll divide it in half or into thirds and I'll drop now and then in a week or maybe you know two weeks, I'll stagger it in, which means one of two things happen. Well, one of three things, I get the same price in every purchase, unlikely. Uh, it moves a little bit higher and then I'm adding to a winning position and I feel like you know winner, winner, chicken dinner, or it's a little bit lower and then I'm getting a bit of discount and I still feel like winner, winner, chicken dinner. And I think what I'm indicating there is a lot of this is hacks that make it comfortable for you as the individual. Um, it goes back to Keith's comment of a moment ago. There's no perfect answer. There's no right or wrong. You've got to find that space. If you think 12 stocks is just like far too few or 20 is far too many, that's fine. I mean, it, it's you're the one yeah. who has to sleep at night. Yeah, if, if I can answer this as well, the market is more complicated than 
a binary decision making process mm -hmm. um, and it's more open ended you don't either own a stock or don't own a stock and as Simon said you can average into a stock so you're managing your risk you can own some of it and then some more and then some more um, I encourage you not to think about these things as, as binary decisions try to be clever in, in how many stocks you hold and maybe it Maybe what you do is, is uh, you have a set number of stocks you hold, or, or, or you have 100% in, in ETFs, and you only add stocks when you, once you find them that you think are better than the market. So over time, hopefully you're selling your ETF and you're transitioning into a portfolio of stocks. Uh, mm -hmm. well, there, there's, there's, there's a million ways to do this. Do not think about this as binary. This is, this is an open-ended problem that you cannot just solve in a unique way today, you can change the way you solve it tomorrow as well. Yes, that's an important point. Um, things will change over time. When I started investing, ETFs didn't exist. I mean, there was no core portfolio. Um, so I had a, a fairly concentrated. In fact, there were points I had a very concentrated, but that's because I didn't have much cash. Uh, we'll leave it there, folks. We are out of questions. We are out of time. Uh, Keith, really appreciate. Uh, this has been video four. You'll find them all on the Just One Lap uh, dot com website. You'll also find them on the Just One Lab uh, YouTube channel if you want to hunt them down there. Uh, I appreciate everyone's time uh, coming, attending, asking questions. Uh, Keith, really appreciate your time putting the four presentations together and uh, presenting them for us. Thanks very much, Simon. Thanks very much for everyone who attended all, all of those presentations. Um, uh, like, Hopefully we've added some value to the world there. So if I can encourage anyone who's listened, watched or viewed these, who's taken value from them to please share them wide and far with everyone. That is, that is the point to make, make the world, make us all smarter, make the world a better place, make the markets more efficient. Yep, agree on that 100%. Cheers, all. stay safe uh, and uh, look after yourselves.